In our news studio, we've been getting questions from you, our viewers. We appreciate it. She's got the latest. Shade? Yeah, Bill, we're getting a lot of questions from Facebook at 7 Online and Twitter. And one issue that kept popping up was about affordable housing. So this is from Pamela. She lives in Harlem, and she considers herself middle class, but she says she can't afford to live in her neighborhood anymore because she says all the empty lot she sees is filled with high-priced condo. So this is her question here. Are plans being made to make affordable housing for those New Yorkers like myself that work and make an income below $100,000 and do not have Section 8? Mr. de Blasio, this question goes to you first. This is, this is the question I hear from New Yorkers probably the most of any question when I'm at subway stops and bus stops and street fairs. This is what people want to talk about. And let me tell you, my plan is for 200,000 units of new affordable housing and preserved affordable housing over the next 10 years. And I'd achieve this by being much more aggressive than Mayor Bloomberg was in terms of the real estate industry, requiring the creation of affordable housing from the real estate industry in any major development that we do, changing our tax code to free up vacant land for housing, uh, using our pension fund dollars to invest in the creation of affordable housing. There is an affordability crisis in this town, and the city government can do a lot more. But you know what? We're going to have to get away from Bloomberg policies that focused on creating luxury housing. The mayor's policies disproportionately supported the creation of luxury housing. Let's be clear, we have enough luxury condos in New York City. What we need is affordable housing for everyday New Yorkers so they can stay in the neighborhoods they love, near their families, near their friends, and that's what I'm focused on creating. Okay, Mr. Lowe. On January 1st, I'm going to declare a housing emergency. The need for affordable housing is overwhelming. It's not just in Harlem, it's in Queens, it's in Brooklyn, it's definitely in the Bronx. We need to find ways to enhance the amount of affordable housing. My plan, which is in conjunction with the Housing First organization, is to build 150,000 units of new additional housing over the next four years. And we're going to need to do that by making sure that any time a building is built, that, you know, and it, they ask for any type of a variance, the cost for that variance is going to be affordable housing. In addition to that, there is space in the city of New York that we need to use, the extra space, surplus space that the MTA has. As mayor, I want it. I want to be able to get that property so we can build exclusively affordable housing throughout the entire five boroughs. Uh, thank you. Mr. Blasio, quick question. You did have a chance as public advocate to fight for affordable housing in Brooklyn, and specifically the Atlantic Yards project. Mm -hmm. But as public advocate, you did not publicly pressure the developer, Bruce Ratner, to provide affordable housing on time and at rents that are indeed affordable. Mr. Ratner happens to be a campaign supporter and contributor of yours. Why didn't you advocate for well, more affordable advocate. housing? I, Bill, I did consistently advocate for it, and I thought that that could have been done. I understand there were lawsuits. I understand that the bad economy cut off a lot of credit that was needed for that project. But I did push hard for affordability there and many other places. With Mr. Renner? Absolutely, and there and many other places in Brooklyn and around the city. The bottom line is we have to require the creation of affordable housing and all new development we do. You know, right now the Bloomberg policy is it's optional. A developer develops a very lucrative project and doesn't necessarily have to create affordable housing, or they say they're going to create affordable housing, but then we don't get it. It should be required. We have the power as a city government to require the creation of affordable housing. For me, this is not debatable. This is something where the city of New York needs to step in and say, this is going to be a requirement from now on. Mr. Loder? Look, the situation with Bruce Ratner and, and uh, what's going on in downtown Brooklyn needs to be rectified. There was a need and, a, and actually agreed to be affordable housing, but it's not being built. We need to make sure that whenever we do these deals, that there is an ability to make sure that we can get something back. He was given tax breaks, tax reductions, and the housing isn't there. We need to get the housing there. We need to hold their feet to the fire and make sure that they do what they promise they're going to do. Okay, thank you both. Let's go to round two. We're going to begin with Dave Evans. But, but, Mr. But can I just follow up very yeah. quickly? Mr. Loder, do you think that it should be a requirement, though, that future developments but that's a requirement to have affordable housing, yes or no? Uh, I don't believe in mandatory inclusionary zoning. I don't believe that that will work. I think it's a violation of the Constitution. The Supreme Court has spoken about this, saying that it's a taking. But what we should do is find the space where we can build affordable housing. There is space all over the city of New York, including the properties owned by the city of New York and some of the state authorities. Let's use it. Let's build ex exclusively affordable housing. How would you pressure I, I them? I respond to that. that uh, it is absolutely legal and appropriate to use the policy as the right name, mandatory inclusionary zoning, but Mr. Loda's assessment is the wrong assessment. It's legal. It's appropriate. It's simply the government of New York City saying to developers, if you want the right to make a very tidy profit, 
on land that we're going to open up for development that you didn't have access to before or you couldn't build as high on, we are demanding affordable housing back in the name of the people. Yes, of course we have that power and we have to use it or don't be surprised if we don't have the affordable housing we need for the future. My plan, 200,000 units, enough to house 400 to 500,000 New Yorkers who need affordable housing. Mr. Lewis, the distinction that I made with, and that you made is that if New York City gives a developer the property, then you have the ability to create the affordable housing as you want. But if a, de if a developer owns the property today and they fully own it, the ability to do mandatory exclusionary housing has been held not constitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States. But you support mandatory uh, inclusion if, it, if a developer took over a piece of property that they hadn't owned private, private previously? Is that what you're saying? No. What I'm saying is that if they were given the property, as Bill just described it, by the city of New York, the way Ratner was given the property by the MTA, then in, and only then should we make sure that okay. we get as much affordable housing as we possibly right. can. Let me be clear, Bill, because I'm still not hearing a clear answer. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Lode is saying in those cases he does support mandatory inclusionary zoning, which is mandatory inclusionary zoning means the city requires the creation of affordable housing. And if it's based on a rezoning or other city action, the question is, would he require it as opposed to the optional approach that the Bloomberg administration has taken? Okay. There's a middle ground that needs to be uh, taken. Well, and that is, if you ask for anything from the city of New York, you will, you will be required when I'm mayor to build affordable housing. There will no longer be 100% affordable housing units okay. if you come to the city of New York and ask for any variance or if you get a piece of property from the city of New York or any state agency or authority. All right. B both of you, thank you. It's a very important... Uh, if complicated issue, but very important for the voters. Thanks. Let's go to Dave Evans for the next question. Dave? My question for Mr. de Blasio is, I think it's fair to say a couple of months ago, most New Yorkers, they didn't know who Bill de Blasio was. Uh, looking at your experience... Dave, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my question is um, about your experience. You, you, you ran Hillary Clinton's Senate campaign. Yes. Uh, you work for the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. You're now the public advocate. Budget of about two, I think, $2.3 million dollars a couple of dozen employees. Contrast that to your opponent's experience. He was the deputy mayor under Giuliani, the budget director, a 70, 71 billion dollar budget is what the city budget is right now. Also, he ran the MTA, what, a 13 and a half, 14 billion dollar budget. My question is, Mr. de Blasio, convince New Yorkers that they should trust you that you have enough experience to run the city. Well, the first question is whose side you're on and what are your values? And yes, Mr. Loda was a top aide to Rudolph Giuliani, the most divisive administration we've seen in decades, the Giuliani administration. Mr. Loda had a ringside seat helping to make that happen. So I have a different set of values. I don't want to leave any New Yorkers behind. I want to address the inequalities of the city. And I think because I've offered forceful vision and real experience, that's why I've won the endorsement of President Obama, President Clinton, Secretary Clinton, Governor Cuomo, people in many cases who I've had the honor to work for. Yes, I was the regional director for the United States uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development covering all of New York State, all of New Jersey, uh, representing President Clinton and Secretary Cuomo. Getting things done, creating affordable housing in our region. Spent four years of my life on the staff of the mayor's office. I know it well. I am a citywide elected official now, second in line of succession to the mayor. Uh, I've had lots of experiences that teach me what New Yorkers need from the grassroots up, and I know how to make New, uh, New York City government deliver for them. And the bottom line is, whose side are you on? Are you ready to change the way we do things in this city? Real progressive change that will serve people who really need the help right now in our city. Mr. Lode, if you... My experience is vastly different than my opponents. I've got more direct uh, management in the city of New York. I was the budget director. Uh, I was the deputy mayor for operations. Uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo asked me and I accepted the position of chairman and CEO of the MTA, but I've spent much more time in the private sector. And what's really important to understand is that I've been there before and I've done it. I can be mayor on day one without any training, without any learning curve whatsoever. And I believe that distinguishes me in this race and overall what I've been able to do. Look, I want a city in which we can work, where we can live, where we can uh, overall continue to raise our families. But what's really important is I, too, want a change in the city government. We can no longer have a city hall that no longer listens to the outer boroughs. Thank you, gentlemen. I had to, Je Bill, just respond to that because, look, it, it's true that Mr. Loda was in the private sector. In fact, a recent report came out that showed uh, he was part of a lobbying effort to get tax breaks for Madison Square Garden. And we know that his economic plan, according to the New York Times, would blow a $2 billion hole in the city budget because it's a classic 
Republican tax giveaway uh, to corporations and wealthy individuals. So uh, it's clear that his private sector experience deeply affected his view. His Republican ideology reflects his view. And the fact is, the, the greatest experience he had in government was serving, serving Rudy Giuliani when, unfortunately, Rudy Giuliani was dividing this city. Mr. No, Lord, I, uh, yeah, go, talk, talk about Madison Square Garden. Go ahead. If you sure. Want to respond to that. Um, I never once lobbied for Madison Square Garden to get any other additional tax breaks. Sixteen what million written, a year. What was written in the newspaper was absolutely wrong. I went to EDC and I spoke to them about the project, the new plan. The garden's been shut down for the last three summers. I wanted everybody in the city government. I went to city planning. I went to uh, the Department of Finance. I went to various different agencies for them to know that it was going to be closed down. It is absolutely an incorrect statement to say that I lobbied the city of New York for tax breaks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but Bill, it is a correct statement to say his tax plan is tax breaks to wealthy individuals and corporations. Very quickly, Mr. Loda, five seconds. Look, when I was budget director of the city of New York, we did a lot of things that included making sure that we didn't cut services, but we were able Thank to find efficiencies in the government combined you, with sir. the fact that we had tax reductions. Okay. You need tax reductions Thank to get this economy moving, to create the jobs necessary to deal with the income inequality. Thank you, Mr. Loda. Uh, and I appreciate you guys sticking to time as we will move in all these important issues. Let's go